Um, we're going to talk in a couple of weeks in terms of getting that fit as far as the team is concerned. Um, you've got the management team, you've got the founder, and that risk-reward structure needs to be matched. And then the, um, the final component of these four anchors is it has to have robust markets, margins, and money-making characteristics. And in terms of what we're talking about making money, we're talking about business models here. Tonight, what we want you to go away thinking about, and sitting with us, Erica, to um, talk about for Kim Corporate Wines, is what is the business model that underpins your opportunity? And there are a multitude of business models out there. You'll be familiar with many of them because you are recipients or customers of business models all, um, all day, every day. But being very clear, how do you create value? And how and where do you make money in your business? And if you can't answer that question really simply, then you have some problems. So we want you to be thinking about that very specifically in relation to your idea. Where do you sit in the value chain? And where, how do you make money? So here are some examples. Are you a business to business? Give me an example of a business to business model. Component? So research is that sell to another company. Components that sell to a manufacturer. Business to business. Their customer is another business, not necessarily the end consumer. Business to consumer, every time you buy as an um, individual, any commodity, you're the customer, you're the consumer. Business to business to consumer is when you have a product that you may sell through a supply chain, so your customer is the purchaser, but the consumer is the end user. So in that situation, you need to know and understand both channels. How do you get your customers, for instance, the supermarkets, to buy your product, but how do you market to the end consumer so that you influence their decision making and purchase decision, okay? So being very clear about who is your customer and is it different to the end consumer. So, you think about as many different ways that you could make money around your idea as possible, and then what's the most appropriate way? And what's the most appropriate way for your idea? So that's one of the challenges we want you to go away this week, thinking very specifically about. And the better you can articulate it now, as you go forward in this process, the better you'll be able to complete the business plan. So here's a whole list of examples. I'm not going to go through each of them, but you can have a look at these and think about that in relation to the ideas that you're considering as part of this process. Subscription, and again, many of these you'll be familiar with. Subscription is if you're looking at a fees-based model, are you thinking about fee by the hour? Are you thinking about fee by the job? Is it a success fee? Is it a percentage fee? So if any of you are thinking about offering professional services, being very clear about this. Licensing, you're familiar with, so is leasing. But a lot of people think about, what, what you need to think about is what do you need to own and what could you lease? And if you have a leasing model, how do you keep the annuity stream? How do you keep that revenue ticking over for long periods of time? And so these are all the implications of knowing and understanding your, your business model in relation to your idea. It prompts you to think about what you need to own, what you actually do, where you sit in the supply chain, what you do internally in your organisation, what you subcontract, subcontract out what you require in terms of funding, both at the initial stages, but also in terms of ongoing as the business grows and develops. Because how you make money impacts significantly on the money you need to fund your business and fund growth. And then how you might actually exit, because it impacts on your role in the organisation as well. So some things for you to think about in terms of understanding and identifying the business model most appropriate to your idea. So what um, we'd like to do now is from having the theory, if you like, up on, um, up on the screens, is to invite Erica to share her story. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar in one way or another with Kim Crawford Wines. Um, this was a, a very successful consumer. business, yeah, <laughs> consumer of Kim Crawford Wines. A uh, very successful business started by Erica and her husband, Kim. So we'd like to welcome Erica along to share their story this evening. Thank you, Erica.
Right. Um, I'm a little bit sniffly and sneezy, so I'm going to just chill the thing when that happens. I'm going to firstly tell you, one of the most amusing things in doing what we do is, I remember about two years ago at this very university that saw this beautiful building, I had an argument, if not almost a fight with one of your lecturers, I don't know if they're lecturers, so I don't even know if they're still here, about entrepreneurs and how they study entrepreneurs and then teach people the models and things. I said, well, it becomes irrelevant, but because by the time you get taught those models, people are on to something else. So, hopefully today, um, I'm going to just look at some of the models in the wine industry, and I hope it has relevance into um, other areas of life, especially agriculture, um, so, that, so that we can just study that. How do I make this thing move on? I'm going to not dwell too much on the story, but try and stay more with the models, okay? But the story is so intricate to the model that, that you're just going to have to pull me back and answer questions, okay? Um, so really all we were, were opportunity spotters. Um, you know, uh, I think that uh, that's really where I should start. And I shall go back. How do I do that? <laughs> okay. We really were just opportunity spotters. And that obviously I am South African and Kim's a farm boy from just outside T Rail and I met him in South Africa and he dragged me here kicking and screaming and guess what? I'm still here. Um, I'll tell you about a little bit about more about our backgrounds at the time, but in the early nineties, you've got to know that New Zealand's not very old in its drinking in its drinking career. And it really only started, I think the first Sauvignon was exported in eight, 1983. Okay? So, at that time when I came here, um, we were drinking Chardonnays that were so oily and so big that you couldn't possibly drink more than one glass. And people were drinking, um, what's that lovely one, something like Lieberstein or Lieber, you know, those things with bubbles and a lot of sugar. But, you know, people drank wine. And then, of course, Sauvignon Blanc took off and away we went. Um, so, at the time when I came out of um, my semi-corporate career, Obviously, I'm a scientist. Then I came to New Zealand to work for a German diagnostics company. It was called Berger Mannheim. And then I had a baby, and then had a second baby, and then we thought, well, we might as well make a wine, a winery, build a winery and a brand. And, and that's really how it came about. But all we were, apart from the babies, were opportunity spotters. And at the time, in the early 90s, there were a whole bunch of people like you, and people with, um, the, there was a demographic, I believe, that wasn't catered for, in that, you know, we, we just started our first jobs, and look, if you go from nothing to a, what we thought was a nice salary, it's heaven, isn't it? And we weren't going to save any, so we spent it all. So, at the time, there wasn't a brand or wine style that, that catered for that, for that demographic. And so, it was really, we just spotted that and you fill it in, because you wouldn't be seen dead drinking the big brands, you know, the Cardi and Super brands. But you also didn't quite know what you were supposed to be drinking, and you weren't going to 